Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a Tuesday afternoon on the uh, West Coast and late Tuesday afternoon on the East Coast. I'm Felicity Barringer. I'm the writer in residence at Stanford's Bill Lane Center for the American West. And uh, we often have programs or events where people come in and talk to us about things that matter to the West. And today we are incredibly lucky to have Blaine Harden talking to us about his most recent book. A little backstory about me and Blaine. Uh, in the late 1970s, a long time ago now, we were both uh, young local reporters at the Washington Post. And that's where we've gotten to know, where we got to know each other. And uh, when we went our separate ways, I've admired his career no end ever since. He worked at the Post for 28 years as a correspondent in Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia. He also covered New York and Seattle. For four years, he moved from the Post to the New York Times and the Times Magazine. Over that period of work, he won the Ernie Pyle Award for covering the Siege of Sarajevo during the Bosnian War and an American Society of Newspaper Editors Award for his Africa coverage. His great talent as a journalist has been fitting people, places, and events into the larger picture of our economies, our lives, and our beliefs. 20 years ago, the New York Times Magazine published his piece about coltan mining in the Central Africa. It had a lead, and for those of you who don't, don't know, that's what journalists call the opening of a piece, but he had a lead on that piece that I've never forgotten. Here it is. Before you make another call on that cell phone, take a moment, close your eyes, and reflect on all you've done for Madadu, Mama Dudu, the queen of the rainforest whores. Thanks to the dollars that you and millions like you have spent on cell phones and Sony Playstations, Mama Dudu had a knockout spring season in the mining camp deep in Central Africa, selling overpriced bread and negotiating terms of endearment among 300 miners and 37 prostitutes. For a miner to secure the affections of a prostitute, he had to bring Mama Dudu some of the most precious ore he was digging up, a gritty, super heavy mud called coltan. That's the end of the lead. The piece goes on to explain that coltan is refined into superconducting metals essential to the hardware of our digital lives. The cell phone market we create gives Mama Dudu a living. Blaine, this was part of an acclaimed book Blaine wrote about Africa. And since, 19, since 2012, he's written three books about North Korea. But you didn't come to hear Blaine, about Blaine the foreign correspondent. His eye, trained to understand foreign cultures, now focuses on the foreign country he calls home, the Pacific Northwest. He's bringing new perspectives to the reality and the myths of his childhood. In 2012, he published A River Lost about the vision and the energy of Americans, including his own father, who created the dams that remade the Pacific Northwest's economy and degraded the Columbia River, the natural river of the Northwest. His new book, Murder at the Mission, offers a relentless reckoning with the lies that undergird the Pacific Northwest's perception of itself and its history. The book examines the lies and the lives of those whose dispossession was justified by those lies, Native Americans who called the region home long before Europeans came. The book also talks about who benefited from the lies as well as who lost. Asking Blaine's, Blaine the questions about the book and conducting this conversation will be Emily Greenfield, a PhD candidate in history here at Stanford University. Her work focuses on American slavery and memory and explores constructions of the past in public space, the remembering and forgetting that unfolds in textbooks and museums, on tour at historic sites and across the landscape of America's memorials and monuments. In a past life, she was a producer of CBS News Face the Nation, and she won an Emmy for a show commemorating the 50th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's assassination, the show aired in 2013. More recently, Emily has worked for the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello and was part of the team that developed the Lives of Sally Hemings exhibit. Emily, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Felicity. And I think uh, I'll give our esteemed author the first word here. 
Blaine, talk to us about this book. Give us a little bit of background before I um, launch into my Q&A. Well, I'll quickly summarize it. The, the book is about uh, uh, some missionaries who came out to the Pacific Northwest in the late 1830s. Um, they came out and they failed spectacularly uh, as missionaries converting only two uh, Cayuse tribe members in 11 years. And at the same time, they, they angered the, the tribal members a great deal and they were murdered uh, along with 11 other white people. And that murder was a pivotal event in the history of the Pacific Northwest. When Congress heard about it, they decided to convert the Pacific Northwest into a shared area with the British government into an American territory, an official part of the United States. And soon it became the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So in, in some ways, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman died to create the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but that's, that's just a part of the story. The real heart of the story is, is about another missionary who came out with them and who the Indians tried to kill, but didn't, a guy named Henry Spaulding, the Reverend Henry Spaulding. About 20 years after the Whitmans were killed, there's, there's uh, the Reverend there. Um, after the Whitmans were killed, uh, Spaulding made up a lie about what Marcus Whitman had done while he was alive. He claimed that Marcus Whitman jumped on a horse, rode across the United States in 1842, and persuaded the president at the time, President John Tyler, to save the Pacific Northwest from a sneaky British plot to take the entire Northwest and make, really make it part of Canada. Uh, Spalding had made up this story and he managed to persuade Congress in 1871 to reprint it. And once it was reprinted, it became the sort of the original source material for the East Coast understanding of the Pacific Northwest. It became the official history of the Northwest for about 40, 50 years. Um, and it was all a lie that Spalding had uh, dreamed up out of resentment, out of an, uh, 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 an effort to uh, exalt what missionaries had done in the West, and out of a, uh, a desire to sort of support this idea of manifest destiny and to demonize uh, tribal people. And that's what the book's about. Excellent, thank you. Well, there's, there's so much we could talk about here. Um, and as Felicity mentioned, I sort of think about memory in my own work. So I say this from a slightly biased perspective, but I think what you've done here is uniquely challenging, right? How do you write a history of a thing that never actually happened? So I thought the first question I might ask you is about process. Um, in researching this book, did you go out looking for the truth or did you go out chasing the myth and find truth in the process? Well, I was a, a victim of the lie. Uh, I grew up in, in Moses Lake, Washington, which is uh, a small irrigation town. And I was a, a, a grade school kid in the early 1960s. Um, and this is uh, more than 100 years, this is 90 years after uh, Spalding had popularized his lie, and about 50 years after it had been debunked by a series of eminent historians at Yale and other places. Um, but the debunking of the lie had not really penetrated the public school system in the Pacific Northwest in the 1960s. And so I learned by acting in a play about the Whitman massacre, a completely fraudulent version of American history. Um, and I really didn't understand what a pack of lies I had been force fed by my public school um, until a couple of years ago when I just started poking around. I was looking for another book to do about the, the Pacific Northwest. And uh, the, the power of this lie that Spalding had made up to make Pacific, the people of the white people in the Pacific Northwest feel good about their uh, taking of all this country uh, struck me as a really interesting story. And it's, it's the power of the lie that is, is really the narrative energy for the book. Uh, and it's not unlike 
other regions of the United States that cling to stories that really aren't true. And I mentioned in the book and the idea that, you know, the Civil War in, 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 in fact was fought as a defense of slavery, uh, sort of, you know, a business decision to enslave other human beings to make cotton farming profitable. Um, but in the decades after the war ended, the Civil War became a conflict, a principled conflict over states' rights. Uh, something similar happened in the Pacific Northwest uh, in the perpetuation of this lie and the price that Native people paid to, uh, to allow white prosperity uh, even in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the county, in the town where I grew up. Okay, I wanna, um, I wanna come back to this point, this kind of parallel between the South and the West. But first, uh, let's dig into this slide just a little bit more. So as you've described, um, and as I read it, it seems like it's really two kind of related uh, myths, maybe not lies, right? The first is this imagined moment where Marcus Whitman sort of saves Oregon from the British. And the second is a set of stories that um, increasingly surround the murder of both Whitmans, which as you describe are put to all of these different political uses. You mentioned this briefly, but I, um, I wanna hear a little bit more about this. You write in the book that nothing accelerated the settlement of the Pacific Northwest more than the killing of the Whitmans, which is a big claim. So. How so? I mean, you, you talked about Congress kind of buying the myth, but I think you also make some really interesting claims about the way that this becomes a template for conquest in the West. So talk to us more about that. Right. What happened in, 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 with the killing of the, the Whitmans, which happened in, in 1847, uh, the next year, Congress learned that it had happened. Uh, the, the, the Oregon country became the Oregon territory and officials were sent out to govern it. Um, and all of a sudden the region had, a, a, you know, American laws. It was governed by the same laws that governed the rest of the United States. And it became much more amenable to settlers. A, a part of the uh, creation of the territory included a law that gave settlers free land if they rolled out there. And they had, they had been coming in relatively large numbers throughout the 1840s, but once it became a territory, they started to come in the several thousands a year over the Oregon Trail. So many wagons rolled across that trail that the trail is still there. You can see it in satellite dishes now. Um, and so it, it created a legal social template for settlement for one thing, that's, that's what happened. Um, but also the, the killing uh, of, the, of the Whitmans, because it was a savage killing in the sense that they, their bodies were mutilated and um, uh, it, it, white women were killed, which was always say a trigger in the West for an overreaction by white settlers. Whenever white women were killed, uh, an inordinate number of native people were then killed in retribution. Uh, this is a pattern that started well before the Whitmans and that went on, you know, all the way until the last Indian War. Um, it, it, the pattern was this, that white was, whites would come out, put pressure on Native people, taking their land, um, making them feel very anxious about their future. There would be a confrontation, white people would die, and then... Um, then the government, the, the military, the federal government and, and, and unauthorized white people would then with extreme prejudice punish the tribal uh, nations and sometimes exterminate them. It happened in Texas, it, California, uh, extraordinary punishment of, of tribal people in California, in Minnesota, and it all was in the same pattern, uh, the pattern that happened in, after the Whitman killing. I'm struck by um, the importance of federal government power in this pattern, right? Because part of the mythology of the West, if we're thinking about kind of the American West as myth writ large, yeah. is this sense of independence, the absence of federal government power, the kind of 
antecedent to the American cowboy setting off on his own, no connections to a sort of federal government. So let's talk about this kind of bigger connection between myth making and the West. I mean, why, what is the sort of hold of this um, myth of independence and the absence of federal power? And what kind of work does that myth do? The idea of rugged individualism, self-making of, of a great land, um, it, 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 at, the, it's, at the same time, it comes with a massive federal presence to enforce and to pay for changes in the land. I grew up in, in the very heart of that paradox. Uh, Bernard DeVoto uh, famously uh, described it this way. It was, get out of town, he's speaking to the federal government, and give us more money. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, in the Columbia Basin, there was a period between 1948 and 1980 where more federal money per capita rained into the Columbia Basin to build dams and to build Hanford Atomic Works than any other place in the United States. And at the same time, there was this profound disaffection towards the the, the feds. And right now, the politics of Eastern Washington, as opposed to where I am speaking to you from Seattle, have much more in common with Alabama uh, than they do with, with, with the rest of the Pacific Northwest or with California. Uh, there's this incredible pervasive power of the myth of rugged individualism that has been subsidized by federal money. People in New Jersey paying their taxes to build dams on the Columbia River. Um, it, it happened when I was a kid and, and it began with, with the, the federal forces coming out in the 1850s to enforce uh, the creation of, a, of the Oregon Territory and to put the Indians onto reservations. So this brings this Alabama reference brings us back to a point you made and I'm reminded of a, a historian you mentioned in your introduction, um, Patty Limerick, who is one of the kind of godmothers of a new history of the West. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she asks us to think about is whether there are a set of sort of moral legacies of conquest in the West that we should be interrogating the same way we interrogate the moral legacies of slavery. And I think based on what I've read and what I've heard you say today, that that's a statement you would agree with, but expand more on this idea. Talk to me about this parallel between a kind of Alabama and an Eastern Washington. I, th I think the best way for me to explain it is, is through my own life. I, I, my father came out to the Pacific Northwest uh, during the Great Depression in a railroad car with a bunch of hungry people. He had nothing. Um, and he uh, sort of came into the, into the Columbia Basin at a time where Franklin Roosevelt and then other generations of Democratic politicians decide to rain all this money, all this federal money, to convert the Columbia River into an electricity machine. Um, and it made uh, the people who arrived, including my family, it made them um, middle class. Um, and at the same time, they credited their rugged individualistic uh, gumption for the, this climb in class. Um, and it, 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 was, it was a powerful, powerful experience that transformed the region. Um, and while this was going on, uh, and before, and before my, my father's generation arrived, this, you know, this country had all been owned um, by Columbia Basin tribes, 30, 40 tribes all around the region. But they'd all been pushed to onto reservations. In fact, the, the reservations in the Pacific Northwest were among the first to take uh, tribal people and instead of sending them you know, from Alabama to Indian country across the Mississippi, like in the Trail of Tears under Andrew Jackson, it took most, almost all of the good land and then put tribes onto smaller reservations on marginal land where that white people didn't want. And once they were on these marginal lands that white people didn't want, they were forgotten about, uh, ignored, uh, uh, seen as an other and seen as inferior. Um, and 
I inhabited that reality growing up in the Pacific Northwest in the 60s and 70s. I went off, I was very lucky to go to college, uh, went off to the Washington Post and became a foreign correspondent and ended up covering uh, the, the collapse of Yugoslavia and the Bosnian War. And particularly, I spent a lot of time in Sarajevo during the siege and covering uh, ethnic cleansing, Serbs murdering Muslims. And the Serbs viewed the Muslims who were basically the same ethnic people, but who had been converted to Islam by a Turkish invasion a few centuries earlier. They viewed them as the other and were perfectly happy to steal their televisions, uh, burn their houses and kill them. Um, and I came home from covering that war to write a book about the Columbia River that, that Felicity mentioned. And I remember going to uh, the home uh, of, of a, of a of a tribal elder on the Colville Reservation and asking him about what had happened to the Columbia River and the salmon and all that stuff. And I told him in, as part of my conversation that I had worked on the Cranguli Dam myself when it was expanded in the 1970s. My father had worked there for many years and it had been the, the reason for uh, our elevation from poor farmer to middle class. Anyhow, so he, he, he looked at me and he, with real hatred, I mean real hatred, and he got up out of his out of his chair and he went to the closet and said, "This is what you white people have done to me. You killed my river, all the salmon are gone, and this is what you gave me." And he pulled a can of government issued salmon out of the closet, shoved it in my face, he said, "This is all that we have left." And as a journalist, I wasn't used to this kind of something really touching me in my life. And that, that happened when I, when I wrote that book was in the, in, the, in the 80s. And it has stuck with me and it's sort of been sort of a guiding uh, principle for the way I, I try to now talk to tribal people. And it, it's difficult, but their anger uh, the anger over the over the death of of the Columbia River and and the, the killing of all the salmon in the river and the salmon that were associated with not not just with their nutrition and their economy but with their spiritual values. Um, uh, so I have tried to take that seriously and then ask other tribes about what happened to them. And for the the Cayuse tribe, which was a small tribe that was. Uh, um, demonized after their after the killing of the of the uh, Whitmans in, in the 1840s um, they have lived with a kind of torment for 160 years for what they did and getting them to talk about it is the the, the latter part of my book I want to talk about the latter part of your book and exactly this kind of project um, and I'm I'm struck by this sort of set of stories that brings us into the 20th century and shows us a lot of continuity, I think, with the earlier period that you're thinking about in your book, right? I'm beginning to see these binaries. So a, a myth of rugged individualism backed by quiet but, but potent federal government power, right? A sense of American belonging or inclusion that is defined by the othering of indigenous people. There's a sort of set of complex binaries that seems to be filling out this, um, this American West mythology. So here's the, here's the question I wanna ask you about the kind of back half of this book. One of the things I really appreciate is that you have both deconstructed a myth in this project, and I think begun to reconstruct a new mythology for the American West, right? A set of stories that push us maybe in productive directions toward um, inclusion and reckoning rather than exclusion and denial. I can sort of see the split in your book. And so what I, wanted to ask you about was these later chapters in which you bring in new voices, new perspectives on Western history and identity. Um, and maybe the big question here is, if we have agreed in this conversation that stories are powerful, right, that the stories we tell ourselves have power in shaping identity, in shaping nationalism, in shaping, you know, projects and people, what stories should we be telling ourselves in the American West? What are some of the key components of a kind of new mythology as, as you might imagine it? Well, I, I think an understanding of the power of this lie that Spalding made up 
is a great way to start um, because it, it, it shows how white America is so easily seduced by a simple action-packed God-ordained story that cast them white people in a good light. Um, and once you can show how that story, uh, how that lie has perverted history and perverted the understanding of how uh, events have unfolded in the West, then all of a sudden you can look more truthfully at the landscape and, and start to understand news stories. And you can understand why native people or you know black people for that for, for, for that matter have such a, a deep abiding suspicion of of virtually everything that comes from white authority uh, it's bred in the bone in a way that's almost incomprehensible to the people who who've been winning um, for a century and a half and telling a story that they won because they were rugged individualists because they were supported by God and because they were harder working than anybody else. Once you start to break those pillars down, then you can begin to understand the history of the West much more uh, uh, holistically. Um, and in, tr in truth, the story of Spalding's lie is much more interesting history than anything that I was ever taught about the history of the Northwest when I was growing up. It's tremendously, it's almost Shakespearean. Uh, in, 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 in turning death and betrayal into a whole new understanding, fraudulent understanding of history. This makes me think, I think it's the closing scene in your book where you're speaking to a, um, a interpreter or national park representative at the Spalding site, right? And you, right. I, I won't, I won't, I'll let you tell the story, but you sort of ask her about this history. Right. So I went to, um, there, there are a couple of Nat, uh, U.S. Park Service sites in 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 the Spalding and Whitman areas of 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 the Columbia Basin, and at one of them, where the Whitman uh, uh, mission used to be, there's been a pretty good rewriting of revisionist rewriting of history, so that the Cayuse point of view is well represented uh, in the um, portrayal of what happened at the mission. But if you if you go to Idaho, which you know, just you, you drive about 120 miles to Idaho, going east, you come to uh, another uh, national park site, the Spalding uh, uh, Cemetery, and Spalding is there presented as a kind of hero, um, and there's not a single word in this in this institution or in the archives there, according to the the people who run it, about what Spalding did. And, and I asked them, have you ever heard of this slide that Spalding made up about, uh, about, saving, about Whitman saving the Pacific Northwest? And the docent there who'd worked there for, I think for 11 or 15 years said she'd never heard of it. Um, so it, it, there's a lot more uh, education to do. In fact, it, just last Saturday, one of the, the Cayuse uh, leaders who's quoted in the book called me up. And he said, you know, we got to get your book into the libraries around here so the white people will read it. Because <laughs> um, we, we, we still don't think that people understand. Um, it, 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 there's, no, there's, there's no a great um, reason for white farmers, uh, the, 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 the political power structure in Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon to really pay close attention to the story. Because if they did, then they'd have to re-examine um, their values. Okay, so I do want to um, dive in a little more on this notion of revisionist history and how we might do that, how you've done it in this book. Um, but this strikes me as a good time to mention to folks who are um, on the call that if you have questions, you can um, throw them into the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen and we'll save a few minutes at the end of this to, um, to let you all I'll weigh in. So, okay, I think one of the things that um, I found fascinating in the back half of this book where you kind of bring us forward in time is that 
you are able to fill in some of the gaps in what we might imagine as a traditional historic record, right? Into the archives, printed paper, newspapers with oral histories, oral yeah. histories from indigenous people who are, you know, intrinsically connected to this story and mm -hmm. feel um, that they can offer the sort of offer context that fills in some of the silence. So talk to me about um, how historians, how the public should be thinking about oral histories and, and how that might help us interrupt some of these silences or some of this kind of mythology um, that we need to correct in a Western space. Well, what's interesting is the, 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 Whitman, stor the Whitman story, the Whitman massacre generated uh, thousands of books. In, uh, in the second half of the of the 19th century and the first 50 years of the 20th century. Uh, and countless magazine articles, scholarly articles, um, and all of it was focused on the white people, uh, on the Whitmans and Spalding, what happened to them. And in almost nothing that I read um, up until the 1980s, uh, did anyone try to talk to the Cayuse and to get their point of view about what happened? Um, things started to change then. Patty Limerick and this, this great herd of rest, Western revisionist historians moved across the West and talked to these people. Um, but in fact, I think there's a still a whole lot more converse, a whole lot more interviewing to do. Uh, and in my conversations with the, the elders in the Cayuse tribe, and I talked to about six people who basically ran the place for the past 30 years, past 40 years. When I would go and talk to them about the Whitman killing, which happened in 1847, in, in, in their mind's eye, it had happened last Thursday. Uh, it was so immediate to them and to their children and to their families. Um, because it's still stuck in their craw as the original sin uh, that uh, has complicated their lives um, and demonized them, not just with white people, uh, you know, with whom they're forced to deal with, but also with other tribes who blame the Cayuse for, for, for doing this, this murder and then for sort of fouling the history um, in, in, in throughout the, the second half of the, of the 19th century. Um, so they really, their oral history, and I found it to be quite precise, uh, what, how they remembered it, what happened compared to what the contemporaneous records show uh, that was written by uh, white people writing letters. One of the things about the Whitman story that is so great for, for a historian is that these were, uh, the missionaries were people of the book. They were relatively well-educated and highly literate compared to the general population. And they wrote thousands of letters to each other and back to the missionary outfit in Boston that was paying their bills. And almost, you know, and, and more than a million words of their letters, uh, some 4,000 letters, I think, have been preserved, cataloged, and are on, um, databases right now so you can you can word search them um, and you can really get almost a day by day accounting of what actually happened in their own words uh, and then compare it with the oral histories that the Indians have handed down to each other particularly the Cayuse because they're the ones who have mem remembered this thing with the most passion and they, they do track quite well um, and of course, it, 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 the, uh, one of the benefits of missionaries coming to the entire United States and dealing with tribal people is that they taught tribal people to read. And it's a really interesting distinction is that um, it, it, as early as like 1750, uh, there was a, uh, and, and throughout the, the, the century afterward, um, missionaries in the South, or they didn't teach black people to read and write. So their written record of what happened to them is skimpy, but they did teach tribal people to read and write. And there are really remarkably detailed uh, written records. Uh, 
testimony before Congress, books, magazine articles, new, entire newspapers over decades, in some cases, uh, the Cherokee, for example, uh, that record exactly what the tribal people were thinking at the time in English, in written material. Um, and that's, I, that, it, it makes it a lot easier to, to do you know, original document research. Yeah, just to bring us back to this parallel with the South, I'm struck by what you just said, because one of the interesting, I think, realizations um, when you think about Southern history is that very rarely is the changing narrative about the discovery of new sources. But it is about the sort of re-examination of values and power in the archive. And suddenly, to bring us back to the Western example, a set of sources that have been available in a Cherokee space, as you describe, or a set of oral histories on the reservations you visited, they've been there. They're, they're sort of waiting for, uh, for a white dominated academic world to pay attention to them. So it's interesting to think about the, again, we're back to this question of power and politics and yeah. in how we write these stories. A book that came out last year, Unworthy Republic by Claudio Sant, who's a professor at the University of Georgia. He went back and found these sources, these uh, printed sources, particularly the, the, the Cherokee newspaper and the books written by the, the, the missionary educated Indians uh, in, in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And it made for an incredibly powerful book. It was, it was breathtaking in how abusive and cruel the Jackson presidency was and the power of white slave owning cotton growers in Georgia and Alabama to use the power of the federal government to manipulate the power of the federal government uh, to push all these tribes across the Mississippi. And those tribes at this very same time were writing uh, newspapers, writing books, testifying before Congress, all of which is there uh, to, be, to be used to, to explain the unfairness of what happened. Uh, and that's what made, I, that, that, it, that book was a huge influence on me. I'm, um... I was so struck by the comment that uh, I think her name was Bobby Connor. You interview her in her book. She directs a cultural center um, yeah. on the Umatilla Reservation. And she says something like, you know, for, as we see it, the settling of the West was the unsettling of the West. And I thought that perspective was so sharp and powerful. And in the way you've described, right, it's, yeah. it's there. It's, we just need to pay attention to a more complex version of yeah. this narrative. You know, one thing that's really interesting for me as a journalist, and, and I, 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 because I, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a newspaper journalist who's become a historian or trying to become a historian. It's a slow process, I think. But when I finished this book, using the normal newspaper techniques of interviewing people and trying really to get to the bottom of it, I sent in the manuscript to my publisher, Viking, and they said, "Well, why don't we take everything you've written and run it through?" some uh, authenticity uh, reads by the tribes in the, in the Columbia Basin. So we did, and including Bobby Connor. Uh, and so they read the entire manuscript and they, didn't, they, they did, had no power to change it, but they just had power to, say, to point out what they thought were stupid things <laughs> that I'd done. Uh, mistakes of, of, of uh, omission, mistakes of, of, uh, of you know, cultural blindness and all of that. And with, in the case of Bobby Connors, she helped me to, to change and rethink hundreds of elements in my book. It, and it improved it dramatically. And it was a process I'd never gone through, but if I write again about uh, Native Americans, I'll do it every time because it, it dramatically improved the book uh, and, and also made it more accurate. Okay, so when we think about myth debunking, right, I feel like we've just identified one strategy, which is disrupt the traditional archive, go to new sources, go to different voices, have uh, readers authenticate the story you're telling from all different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the other space we might talk about debunking is one that Americans have been fixated on for some time now, which is the kind of physical landscape of memory, right? We're constantly debating the future of a monument or a memorial. And Whitman 
the Whitman story has something to say to us about this, right? So talk to me about the status of the Whitmans in stone and how that um, story has shifted or, or perhaps hasn't in the last little while. Well, there's a wonderful parallel to the South uh, in, in, in the Whitman in stone element of the story. Um, in the South, uh, statues of Civil War generals really did not populate cities until the 20th century, where they started to be built by the dozens in medium and small towns, big towns across the South. Long after the Civil War, but during the Jim Crow era and during this era where, where a lot of Southerners had convinced themselves that the war, the Civil War was about states' rights and not slavery. Um, so that's, that's the South. In the Pacific Northwest, the, the lie about who Whitman was and whether he was a great hero, a great American hero or not, had been very, very thoroughly demolished, in fact, by a professor at Yale and by a, uh, a, an amateur historian in Chicago around, the night, around 1900 and 1901, 1902, 1903. And there was no scholar worth his salt in the United States who believed that Whitman was anything other than a mediocre missionary who got killed by the Indians because of a, of a measles epidemic that the Indians blamed him for. That was the sum total of the truth in the story. But the false story about Whitman being this, this great uh, Lewis and Clark kind of visionary uh, who saved the Pacific Northwest from a British plot, that persisted despite the evidence all the way through the first half of the 20th century. In 1953, which is 53 years after the story was debunked in the New York Times and in the American Historical Association, the state of Washington and the legislature in its wisdom decided that the finest example of achievement by anyone who had ever lived in the state of Washington was Marcus Whitman. So they made a statue of him in buckskin with a Bible and put him in the US uh, Hall of Statuary in the US Capitol, where he, he remains to this day, except in uh, March of this year, the state legislature, uh, um, there's something in the air about Whitman that's uh, about the time my book came out, they decided that they wanted to get him out of there. So they've replaced him with a Native American who fought for fishing rights in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and his statue is still there. It hasn't come out yet, but it will in, the, in coming weeks. And you mentioned another statue of him, right, on his own college campus that's yeah. in the, the, story, the, the, story the Whitman, most discreet place possible on campus. The story of Whitman College is such an interesting part of the book is that Whitman College was going broke um, in the late 1890s. It couldn't pay its, its um, faculty. It couldn't pay the mortgage. And it was on the brink of... of bankruptcy when the president, uh, a, a young uh, a guy from Philadelphia named Stephen Penrose, he decided, uh, he read about the Whitman uh, saving Oregon story, and he decided that this is such a great story that if he told it to um, people in, the, in New England particularly, but across the East Coast, that they would give money and save the college. And it, it worked so well, it saved the college and turn Whitman into what is now probably the best private liberal arts college in the state of Washington and one of the best in the West. Um, and it, without the Whitman lie, the school would have gone broke. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. In the 1990s, a copy of the statue that's in the US Capitol was given to Whitman College. But by then the faculty particularly the faculty had come to understand that the story of Whitman was bogus. And they were embarrassed by Whitman, uh, the namesake of their college. And so they put the statue next to a railroad tracks on the very edge of campus. And one faculty member said they hoped that a train would get derailed and destroy the statue. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but the statue is soon to be removed. Uh, by the will of uh, the faculty and students at Whitman College to an undisclosed location at this point. So this maybe connects nicely to a question um, from one of our viewers, which is about the timing of 
the kind of debunking of this Whitman myth. And I think based on the question that the impression is that this myth, at least in certain circles, gets debunked faster than other American myths. The question is why? I mean, why, why did this particular myth get interrogated um, maybe sooner than some of the other myths that we continue to, to hold on to and to use uh, politically in, the, in a US context? Well, the, the myth was, I, it, it, I'll, just, I'll just speak particularly to this myth and what happened. Because uh, because it's it's interesting how it it was debunked. As I said, it was debunked quite uh, suddenly uh, by a presentation by a Yale professor at a conference of the American Historical Association in in Lance in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, in 1900. Um, and the next day, the Los Angeles Times said all the books have to be rewritten because this has been debunked. But some, just because the facts demand a debunking of, of a story, that doesn't mean that the people who believe in the story will accept those facts. Um, Whitman College clung to the story of Whitman being this hero who saved Oregon because it was great for fundraising and because the president of Whitman College believed it despite the facts. And for example, in Washington state, they had these huge festivals in the 30s and 40s and 50s that brought tens of thousands of people to, to Walla Walla, to Whitman College to celebrate Whitman, uh, even though it was totally bogus. And the newspapers went along with it. Um, and then after the Vietnam War, when some students started to pay attention to native people and there was the American Indian movement, uh, then what the school decided to do, rather than to say, okay, we made a big mistake, we uh, shouldn't have advanced Whitman's, uh, the story about Whitman uh, so long for our own pre preservation as a school, they just quietly walked it away, walked away from it. It's like they, they took the story, put it in a closet, closed the door, and pretended it never existed. And that exact, that kind of uh, benign neglect actually continued until after 2010. And then students started to grumble. And then slowly, slowly, um, people like me started to sniff around and do books. What's, what's strange and not particularly delightful to me, but two other books on the same subject uh, are out this year in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one came out a few months before mine and another is coming out this fall. And they're all by, you know, they're, they're, these, these, are, these are good historians, all of whom, for reasons that I don't quite understand, have decided to, to, to get this down in, in, in a contemporary revisionist history. It's, it's interesting. It makes me think that we should be talking about debunking as a process. Right, as a sort of multifaceted yeah. process, because in the way you've described, and this is a good humbling reminder to historians that the stuff you say at the AHA doesn't necessarily right, solve um, questions of historical truth for future generations. Right. This takes kind of many layers, and it sounds like your book is at the forefront of the latest layer of yeah. the kind of process of debunking. Yeah, I think one of the things that's important to understand is it's not just the truth that's important. It's the lies that people believe over a long period. Uh, you could also say the myths that people believe over a long period of time. And the West was particularly uh, influenced by myths uh, because they were being propagated and used in the East uh, as the same time as the West was settled. As I point out in the book, um, um, in fact, let me let me just I, I, I wanted to highlight this this thing. Um, let me just read a paragraph. The myth the, the West, is that okay? Um, Please do. West, yeah. Okay. The West was mythologized, that is, lied about at the same time it was being settled. Indian chiefs and Indian fighters ranged back and forth between flesh and fantasy, between the real West and its dime novel, dime novel doppelganger. Sitting Bull, leader of the Sioux, used the break between the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876 and the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890 to tour Europe and the United States while performing for pay in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. 
Kit Carson, an actual Indian fighter, failed in 1848 to save a white woman from Apaches. But near her arrow-riddled corpse, he discovered a dime novel about the fictional Kit Carson, who never failed to save a good white woman from Indian peril. Having stumbled upon his better, more marketable mythical self, the real Kit Carson immediately decided to cash in on it, writing or rather dictating, since he couldn't read, an autobiography about his unfailing skills. Um, and the, the West was really shaped by lies, uh, told contemporaneously with some of the people who were actually living in the West. And um, the, 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 news, the, the railroads, for example, said that the West was great for farming, all of the West. And so people came by the thousands and were dropped off in places like Eastern Montana, parts of Kansas and Oklahoma that were completely unsuited to farming and they ended up destroying the land and creating the Dust Bowl. And so the lie about the West was as important as any truth um, in shaping what it's become. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the ways in which the lie is baked into the the very moment of sort of promoting the West, right? right? These early sort of promoter efforts to bring people are founded on on many of the aspects of the lie that you've unpacked. Yeah, and it, it is in a certain sense, if you're a white person coming out, taking other people's lands and killing them, you got to lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's pretty hard to uh, you know explain what you're doing to your kids. I think you also point to this in your book that the the ways in which distance matters in the early stages of this story, right? It takes months for a letter to get right. from the East Coast right. to you know your missionaries in the West. And so there is also this sort of space for the lie to grow and be watered and right. kind of take root in the soil right. to continue the metaphor. Yeah, and, and the great example of that was, was Henry Spaulding himself, is that he spent um, 40 years out in the West, and during which he sort of disclosed his character to all of the newspapers, editors, and journalists in the Pacific Northwest, who by and large thought that he was a, a mendacious, blowhard, anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant jerk. And they said as much in the newspapers. But when he went back East to tell the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress and all the newspapers back on the East Coast about what was the real history of the West, because he had a beard, because he 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 had a, a sense for what what people wanted to hear in the East, he was believed as an oracle, an authentic Western um, voice, and the distance uh, actually in in his case gave him more authority because he was coming from a place that they couldn't really see at that point. They could. They took his word for it. And he managed then to promulgate a lie that took off. This connects nicely actually to a question from one of our viewers, which is about why, speaking of sort of deluding oneself, why these missionaries who you write about were so confident that Native American tribes would assimilate. And the follow-up to this question was, weren't they aware of what was happening in Northern Georgia with Cherokees? Well, they were very much aware of what Andrew Jackson uh, and the Indi Indian Removal Act was doing in um, the Southeast. They were really, and they were very concerned about it. The people at the, at the, the, the Board of uh, Missionaries in, in Boston, uh, in fact, they charged the missionaries to get out West and teach tribal people to be Christians and give them the skills that will allow them to survive the coming invasion of the white hordes. Uh, that was, and th that motivation was genuine, and it was well-meaning. Um, and, and in some cases, Spalding, in fact, with the Des Perce tribe, among whom he settled, he did manage to convert a lot of people, educate a lot of their leaders, and give them a chance for 20 or 30 years of interaction with white society that preserved a lot of their land and their self-respect. It ultimately collapsed in a war, but it, it did sort of work. Um, but on the other hand, the missionaries were so ethnocentric uh, 
so focused on uh, Calvinist Protestantism, which was incomprehensible to most white people and completely to Indians who are learning it through, you know, a filter of a couple different languages, um, that they failed completely to, uh, to convert almost anyone. I mean, they, they were there for, for decades and converted, you know, enough people to fill a room, um, basically. So this has been fascinating. And I hope for those of you on the call that um, you are excited to hear and read more because there really is more to unpack in this book. I think my final question for you, Blaine, you touched on this, but given that you know you wrote this book following a slew of books and re reporting assignments abroad, my final question for you is, to what extent is this an American story? I mean, is this the ugly underbelly of American exceptionalism or is this, a human story about the proclivity for myth-making. What do you think? Well, no, I, I think that it, it's, it's the former, that um, Americans behave very much like everybody else. Uh, in my experience of covering particularly the collapse of Yugoslavia and the Balkan Wars, the Serbs who were the, uh, the antagonists in the collapse of Yugoslavia, they demonized the... Um, the Muslims in Bosnia and the Catholics in Croatia uh, and in Slovenia as a, um, an other, um, an, an enemy that wasn't quite measuring up to the humanness of being a Serb. And this was a part of the, the big um, propaganda cell that Slobodan Milosevic made uh, to using television, mass media, uh, in a, in, almost like Hitler used television and mass media in, in Nazi Germany, um, it, it, to prosecute wars and to stay in power. That's what he wanted to do was to stay in power. And it worked for a while. Um, and I think that uh, American whites, the majority, the dominant culture, uh, convinced themselves that in the settling of the West, and in slavery um, with, with, with African people, that they were dealing with an other, with an inferior race. Um, and this was a, a way to justify. And you know, they were the God, God chosen people, manifest destiny and all that stuff. And it, 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 it made it easier to do what they really needed to do, which was to take their land uh, and to make money on the land. Um, it, it, the story is that, that there's there's a whole lot more in, in that they share in common that are, than separated. Um, that, that's 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 my view. Thank you so much. Somehow it's three o'clock, so I'm going to turn things back over to Felicity. With thanks, Blaine, I was just fascinated. Thank you. Great questions. I don't know how that hour went so fast. Um, I'm completely fascinated. Uh, there, I, I know we're at three uh, at three o'clock. There are questions we didn't get to. Apologies for those uh, who asked questions about the Klamath or who were reminiscing about uh, their own high school days in California and what parallels there may be between the Whitmans and Unipro Sarah. But uh, it, they're all questions for all of us to think about. That's what this hour has done, has given me and all of us an awful lot to think about. I really thank you, Emily, for conducting this conversation in, in such an intelligent and, uh, and provocative way. And Blaine, it's a terrific book and I loved hearing about it and loved hearing your descriptions. Thanks everybody for coming. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.